Well, good morning. You can turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. And while you do that, kids ages 4 to 7 can head down to uh, Junior Church. If you haven't checked your kids in yet, go ahead and go out with them. There'll be people to help you with that. Um, Probably can stop announcing that soon. You all know the drill by now with our new check-in system and all of that. But uh, only got to check your kids in once uh, a morning. But if you haven't done that, there'll be people out there to help you. Uh, this morning for Children's Church. I uh, saw somebody at the Blueberry Festival from Westwood last night, and they said, I I heard that you're preaching on all ten of the plagues tomorrow. And I said, no, no, just the first nine, all right? Not all ten. We're not going to get carried away. Uh, Just plagues one through nine, and that's going to take us from Exodus chapter 7, verse 14, all the way through chapter 10, verse 29. And so in an effort not to have anybody pass out from locked legs uh, and be able to comment on this text as well, Uh, I'm going to have you just follow along and I'll point out some verses as we talk through these plagues and there'll be a part towards the middle that I'll have you stand out of respect for God's word um, and and follow along as as I read it. But uh, Exodus chapter 7, starting in verse 14, uh, you, you know if you've been here up to this point, they're coming to the kind of the culmination in Exodus with these first nine plagues that the Lord is going to afflict Egypt with as part of redeeming his people. These nine plagues that are ramping up ultimately to the 10th plague, uh, which is going to finally humble Pharaoh and allow God's people to leave the bondage that they've experienced for generations in this Uh, enemy territory of of Egypt. And so starting in chapter 7, verse 14, it kicks off with the first plague. The scripture says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking the water from the Nile. And of course, this is exactly what happens. Moses goes and he meets Pharaoh in the morning as he does multiple times throughout this narrative. He strikes the water of the Nile and it turns into blood. But verse 22 of chapter 7, the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. And he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And so seven days pass, and plague number two, the frogs come. And we find the first cycle of this begging of Pharaoh to have the, the, the plague uh, abate and be, uh, have re- relief brought to Egypt. And then, of course, he reneges on the promise that if Moses and Aaron will bring the relief, that he will indeed let uh, God's people go. We see that in verse 8 of chapter 8. Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron and said, plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people Go to sacrifice to the Lord. Well, of course, these great consequences of Pharaoh's pride and the frogs leave and they're piled up and they're dead. In verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And so... The Lord afflicts Egypt with another plague. The gnats are plague three, and the gnats come, and they're in everybody's eyes and in all over the place, driving everyone nuts. And then in verse 18 of chapter 8, the magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. 
So there were gnats on man and beast. And then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And so round four, we have the flies that come. And it's interesting here, first instance of the Lord explicitly explaining how he's going to spare his people in verse 22 of chapter 8. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people." So despite these flies coming and infesting Egypt and the land of Goshen where God's people dwell, being spared of this fourth plague, yet still, verse 32 of chapter 8, Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Well, after the flies come the death of the livestock, And so, again, all the livestock, it says in verse 6 of chapter 9, of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Same with the boils, that is the sixth plague. It comes upon all of the Egyptians in verse 11, uh, the, uh, the magicians, I guess, are, are kind of subject to some extra boils along with the uh, other Egyptians. It says in verse 11, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of these boils. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And I want to read an extended passage here, starting in verse 13 of chapter 9. So if you would, stand out of respect and follow along as I read. Here where Moses has a a dialogue on the Lord's behalf and explains what really is going on with these plagues, the seventh plague of hail. Chapter 9, verse 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now, therefore, send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter for every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. God's being merciful even in his judgment here, giving him warning. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation." The hail struck down everything that was in the field. In all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no 
hail. Skip down to verse 34. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants, so that the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. He did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. You can take your seats. So we have the seventh plague. The hail has come down. Number eight, then, are the locusts that come. And we see it's not just that the power of the Lord may be known to the Egyptians, but it's for God's people as well. If you look at chapter 10, starting in verse 1, Then the Lord says to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart in the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. And so this swarm of locusts like Egypt had never seen comes and devours everything that the hail hasn't already destroyed. But yet, verse 20 of chapter 10, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go. And finally, we have the 10th plague, or the ninth plague, rather, the darkness that comes all over Egypt. Again, the land of Goshen where the people of Israel dwell are spared. And even after all of this, Verse 27, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, that's Moses, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. Let's bow and pray together and ask the Lord's blessing on this reading and, and teaching of his, his word. Father, we thank you for this great demonstration of your power, God, over the Egyptians in order to bring them to heal and redeem your people. I pray that you would give us insight into this story, the story of true, real events that happened in history and that we might learn from how you worked to redeem your people all these years ago and how you are still working to redeem people for yourself today. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I've never, uh, never did serve in the military, but I've always been fascinated by military history, whether it was, uh, right, the, the Roman short sword that had given them the edge to conquer the world or the, the Vikings that have the shield wall that defended them and made them so ferocious or the stirrups in the Middle Ages that allowed the knights to actually stay on the horse with all their heavy equipment of armor and swords and lance or uh, to modern day, right? How, how strategy has changed and how things have changed with technology and how you got to use the lay of the land. Even today, with all of the high-tech equipment, we have the land and the terrain actually matters in, in warfare. And from what I understand, one of the things that makes the United States of America such a uh, military threat, such a power mili powerful military force is its, its air force. Right, the, the technology that it has in its planes and its helicopters and its ability to control the skies, right? That's how Desert Storm was won so quickly and decisively through the technology and the power that the U.S. had in the air. It's the discussions that we're having right now about Ukraine. Right? The reason why Ukraine's offensive against Russia is going so slow and they're getting bogged down is because they don't have the air support that they need. And so the big political debate is when and how and whether to send that superior technology to them or why was uh, the U.S. able to uh, occupy Afghanistan for so long with really at the end such a relatively low loss of American lives. It was because the Afghanistan military were out in the hills accomplishing their missions 
And the reason why they would be able to be so successful is because of the U.S. air support, right? And you've seen the, the movies. I remember seeing many of these war movies where the, the U.S. Got soldiers are pinned down in Vietnam or somewhere else. And it seems hopeless. They're in need of rescue and salvation. And so what do they do? They call in the air support, right? And the jets come or the helicopters come. And this superior show of force brings salvation of these soldiers, Well, it's kind of akin to what we see in our text this morning. The people of Israel are in a hopeless situation. They're in need of salvation, but what the God of the universe, their God, wields against Egypt to bring judgment on the Egyptians and the redemption of his people is not just a superior technology, not a superior fighting force. No, he's wielding creation itself to bring judgment upon the Egyptians in the redemption of his people. And I think that's the takeaway that I want us to see from these plagues, kind of the larger picture of what's going on in plagues one through nine that we just walked through. It's this, God wields creation for the purpose of redemption. Anytime we see redemption, there's always judgment that comes along with it. But we see here the primary emphasis is God wielding creation for the purpose of redeeming his people and bringing judgment upon the hard-hearted Egyptians, Pharaoh himself. And so what I want to do in the time that we have here to look at this text this morning is to just ask some questions that maybe are on your mind reading through these Questions of reflection that we can use as uh, starting points for some application, some lessons that we can learn from this story of the nine plagues that God afflicts Egypt with for the purpose of the redemption of his people. And so three questions if you're kind of outlining this in your mind. The first question is this, are these plagues natural or are they supernatural? Might be a question on your mind. Are these plagues natural or are they supernatural? Then I want to ask and draw our attention to the question, what can we learn from Pharaoh in this story? What can we learn from this great ancient king who God is raising up in order to demonstrate his power against him? And then lastly, we'll look at what we can learn about God from this story of the plagues, plagues one through nine. So first of all, is it, is what's going on here as we see God wielding creation for the purpose of redemption and judgment, is what's going on here natural occurrences or are they supernatural? We're all very familiar with the plagues, right? They're kind of burned into our imagination from Sunday school and from movies. I remember growing up and watching the Charlton Heston Ten Commandments movie, and and I, I was actually thinking about it, and I was thinking about it this week and thinking to myself, how come we never watch the whole movie, right? Well, then I looked it up on Internet Movie Database, and it's three hours and 40 minutes long, right? I mean, that's why we never watched it all in one sitting. But I remember as a little kid watching it and having these plagues and this miraculous encounter between God and Egypt burned into my imagination. Or how many of you have seen the cartoon Prince of Egypt? All right, great music, uh, actually a, a pretty amazing cast of the, the voices behind the main, the main characters. And I mean, sure, there's elaboration on what the Bible actually says, a sort of thing, but, but it, it remember watching that and, and it gripping my imagination, seeing Moses, right, jab his staff into the Nile and it just, the blood going, right? And then their interpretation on the Egyptians in the dark arts, right? They pull out the little uh, red powder and blow it into a bowl and, and Pharaoh is a, supposedly pleased with that, right? And, and continues to harden his, his heart. But there's, there's new ones as well. There's the, the Christian Bale Moses movie recently. 
that starts to kind of undermine in our minds this fact that God is working miraculously, supernaturally in the Exodus, right? The crocodiles go nuts and kill everything, and that's why there's blood in the Nile, and it, it sets off this uh, series of events. I remember watching a documentary also as a, as a young person, teenager or college, that tried to, tried to explain all of the plagues of Egypt in natural terms, right? How it's not really, it's not really blood. The Nile's not really turning to blood. It's these microbes from Ethiopia that give the, the river a tint of red. And that makes that and the, the, uh, the, the fish that have died because of these microbes coming in the river, it makes the, the frogs want to abandon the river. And so that's why the frogs are all over the land of Egypt, right? And because they had these rotting fish in the river, they were carrying anthrax with them. And so that's why the, the gnats are attracted because all these frogs die from the anthrax and then the gnats come and then the, the flies come because of that too, because of all these rotting, stinking animals and the flies spread disease to the livestock and then the flies spread disease from the livestock to the people and that's why there's these, these boils, right? It's all explainable in human terms. Just natural occurrence. The plagues seven, eight, and nine are just climactic, climatic conditions, rather. It was just an exceptionally violent thunderstorm. It was just a really bad year for locusts. It was just a desert sandstorm that caused all of the darkness in Egypt. Maybe you're familiar with these kind of arguments as people try to undermine our confidence in what the Bible says. I mean, maybe, maybe that's how God worked. It's plausible, I guess. But man, the timing is beyond coincidence, right? I mean, just one right after another, even if God is working in this way. I don't think he is. I mean, think about the discrimination, right? Think about how the, the, the people of Israel are, are spared, how the Hebrews are, are spared while the Egyptians are being afflicted. Sometimes it's implicit, but sometimes it's explicit. We looked at a couple of the explicit ones, but look at chapter 7, verse 24. Just a, a, a little bit more of a careful reading of the text. All the who? The Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. So the Egyptians are the ones who are thirsty, but not God's people. Or chapter 8, verse 3, as the frogs are coming, the Nile, Moses says, shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house, Pharaoh, and into your bedroom, and on your bed, and into your houses, into the houses of your servants and your people, and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. So there's going to be a whole lot of frogs. And where are they going to be? In the houses of the Egyptians. And that's precisely how it plays out. The flies, the same thing in chapter 8, verse 22. We read about this. God is making a point by sparing the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put division between my people and your people. So the reason that God is even sparing his people here is as to show his demonstrating his power, to show his power over the created order. Same thing with the livestock, chapter 9 and verse 4. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And that's precisely what happens. It's implicit with the boils in chapter 9, verse 11. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all of the Egyptians. It's explicit with the hail, again, as we saw in chapter 9 and verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. 
locusts. It's the same thing. Chapter 10 and verse 1, he says to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I may show these signs of mine among them so that you can tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I've dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. And again, explicitly when it comes to the darkness, I don't know about you, I don't know of any sandstorms that kind of just don't go on a certain plot of land, right? No, God is sending darkness and he's sparing his people of these calamities. And so I think they're supernatural. I think God is bringing calamity on the Egyptians and he's sparing his people while he's doing it just so that the world can see the object lesson, which again is the main point that God is using creation. He's wielding creation for the purpose of redeeming his people while he is bringing judgment upon the Egyptians. It's clearly meant to be supernatural, and and I think questioning whether these are real events, historical events that took place like the pages of Scripture tell us, I think that it undermines the text's credibility and therefore undermines its theological point that God, the God of Israel, is the creator God. The God who rules and reigns over creation and wields it however he likes to accomplish his purposes in history. It's supernatural work of God as he wields creation for his purposes in this story. Well, what can we learn from Pharaoh then? What can we learn from Pharaoh in this story? Well, I think one of the applications that stuck out to me is just observing the downward progression of hardening. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh is unconvinced in the end, even when most everyone else in Egypt is convinced. Look at chapter 10, verse 7. This is after the locusts have come and they've eaten up everything that remained after the fiery hail. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let them go. Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? Don't you get it? I mean, they're actually being kind of bold with Pharaoh at this point. I mean, they just suggested it earlier on, right? This is the finger of God. We can't reproduce the gnats. So we're not sure what's going on here. This is supernatural. This is something out of the ordinary. This is something you should wake up to, Pharaoh. Well, here, by the time Egypt is literally burning down around them, they're saying, can't you see that Egypt is ruined? Relent, let him go. Let him go to the wilderness and worship this God who's clearly bringing this judgment upon our land. But he doesn't, does he? And not only that, you see him spewing venom at Moses. It's interesting, up to this point, up to the end of the ninth plague, there's no threats against Moses. Moses seemingly is just coming out in the morning and telling Pharaoh what's gonna happen, and Pharaoh is hands off with Moses, but after the ninth plague, he gets to the point where he is, right, he is spewing venom and attacking the messenger. Moses isn't the one who's doing this. He's simply the messenger. He's simply God's mouthpiece. He's God's instrument. But yet Pharaoh is lashing out and threatening that he will kill him if he sees his face again. And so we see this downward progression of Pharaoh's hardened heart. And what I, what I want us to see this morning is this, that no, we don't start there. We don't start in a place where where contrary to all evidence and all reason, we refuse to acknowledge God and do what he's asking us to do. 
and lash out at his messengers, pointing fingers and throwing blame other places. No, that is a place where we get to as there's a continual progression of the hardening of the heart. Pharaoh didn't just wake up one morning and decide, you know what I want to do? I want to self-destruct. I want Egypt to be ruined all around me. I want to just dig. I don't, I don't care. I'm just going to dig in. I'm going to do it my way, and I don't care what happens. He didn't wake up thinking that one day. There was a downward progression of hardening. He didn't determine to ruin himself and his kingdom. It was a series of incremental decisions. Did you catch? We pointed it out as we read through this narrative. Pharaoh's heart is hardened at the beginning. His heart remains hardened at the end of the first plague, the blood. After the frogs are all dead, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. He's taking the initiative there. At the end of the gnats, plague three, his heart was hardened. At the end of the flies, plague four, Pharaoh hardens his heart. At the end of the fifth plague, the livestock dying, his heart is hardened. It's not till we actually get to the sixth plague, the boils, that the narrative introduces that phrase, the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now, of course, the Lord is sovereign over history and sovereign over Pharaoh. And that's why in the weeks leading up to this, we've seen the Lord time and time again say, I'm going to harden Pharaoh. But notice when we actually get to the unfolding of historical events in the plagues, it's Pharaoh hardening, Pharaoh hardening, Pharaoh hardening, Pharaoh being hardened until finally the sixth plague, the Lord actively steps in and begins hardening Pharaoh's heart. We see this downward progression incremental decisions. One plague after another, Pharaoh refuses to bend the knee. He refuses to acknowledge God, refuses to do what God has asked him to do, which is simply let his people go. And we find him at the end, someone who the Lord has raised up in order to bring down and show his power through the total destruction of him and his kingdom. This is how it works in our lives, too. We're not Pharaoh. We don't have a kingdom, but we're little kings over our kingdoms, right? Little queens over our kingdoms and what the Lord has given us. And we don't just wake up one morning thinking, you know what? We want to self-sabotage. Just want to ruin my life, ruin the life of the people around me, ruin everything that the Lord has gifted me with. I just want to throw it all away. We don't wake up one morning doing that. It's through a series of hardening, a series of incremental decisions that we make that bring us to our own destruction. I don't think men wake up one day and decide, you know what I want to do? I want to cheat on my wife and abandon my kids and lose my reputation and be disciplined by the church and have all of this destruction in my life. They make a series of decisions incrementally being desensitized and hardened to their sin until they get to the point like Pharaoh where they really do choose self-destruction over redemption. I don't think somebody wakes up one morning and decides, you know what, I want to be addicted to this substance such that it's all that I can think about. It controls my life, destroys my health, and takes away everything that the Lord has given me. But they say, yes, incrementally make poor decisions and you see the downward progression, the hardness of the human heart until they wake up one morning and are eventually there, willing to throw everything away for some dumb alternative. I don't think somebody wakes up one day and says, you know what, I want to be a bitter old woman (laughs) such that my kids don't want to have anything to do with me and my grandkids don't want to call me and my neighbors avoid me, and I don't have any friends. But we know people like this, right? They're so miserable to be around that they alienate and isolate themselves. They didn't just wake up one morning and do that. They made a series of incremental, poor decisions, sinful decisions, and that slowly hardened to the point where that's where they find themselves, like Pharaoh, unwilling to see the obvious, unwilling to do the simple right thing that would bring 
relief. It's our choice in situations like that not to reverse course, just like it was Pharaoh's. I don't understand how it all works. God is raising Pharaoh up in order to humble him and demonstrate his power. But I really believe if Pharaoh would have let God's people go earlier, he wouldn't have got to this point. Both of those things are true. Pharaoh's responsible for himself and his decisions, and he could have reversed course and made it stop. He had the uh, abort button, right? Like you have in the aban abandoned ship, right? He, he could have been done, but he doesn't. And the scary thing is it becomes increasingly harder to do the right thing the longer we stay in a pattern of sin and hardening. That's why Pharaoh finds himself against all advice, against all evidence, against his experience, against everything that he can see with his eyes, choosing not to acknowledge God and not to do what God has called him to do. We see the downward progression of hardening in the example of Pharaoh. We also see the possibility of false repentance. This is another sobering thought when you think about Pharaoh. I don't think this cycle of begging and reneging because the consequences are blunted or abate or go away. I don't think Pharaoh necessarily doesn't say in the text. It says he's, he's genuine, right? He comes and says, Aaron and Moses, come before me. He begs, he pleads for the consequences of his sin to be taken away. And as soon as the consequences of his sin are taken away, he goes right back to his sin. I don't know whether it was manipulation or not, at least intentional manipulation. The text doesn't say that. It says that Pharaoh seemingly is really sad about the destruction that's going on to him and his people around him. And so he begs for it to stop. But it's false repentance. The Bible talks about this elsewhere. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I think this is one of the most, I don't know, underemphasized but most important verses when it comes to real heart change in our lives at the beginning of the Christian life, when it comes to being a disciple, when it comes to evaluating whether someone is sincere in their remorse and the conviction and confession of their sin. But the Bible makes a distinction. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Starting in verse 9, just two verses. Paul says, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. And here's the key, verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. So there's two kinds of people in the world when consequences for their sin comes. There's the kind of people that grieve and it leads to death. And there's the kind of people that grieve and it leads to repentance and life. And on the front end, that looks really, really similar, I think. How do you evaluate whether someone's grief, whether the conviction that they feel over their sin and the confession maybe that they're making and, and the, the, the changes that are seemingly being made in their life, how do you evaluate whether that's actual godly grief wrought by the Holy Spirit and it's true repentance? You evaluate that based on the actual life change. Don't have time to read it, but if you, if, you, if you look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 12, just listen. This amazing verse with all, or this chapter in the Bible, with all of its encouragement, Paul says this, So then, brothers, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's repentance. 
For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Right? This beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit sealing us with assurance of our salvation, of all the glory that is to come. But we often skip over the last phrase in verse 17. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. See, life change for the Christian hurts. It's suffering. It's the gym model, no pain, no gain, right? I'm not saying you should want it, but if you want six-pack abs and to confidently rip off your shirt at the beach in the summer, you know what the price tag of that is? Suffering, right? Watching other people eat what you want to eat when you can't, right? Going to the gym when you'd rather sleep in the morning, right? It takes sacrifice, there's something to it. There's, if you say that you want it, if that, that motivation is actually sincere and real, it takes sacrifice. It costs. It's the same in the Christian life. There's a putting off of the old man, the flesh that Colossians 3 talks about. Putting on the new man. And that hurts and it takes sacrifice, but that is how we evaluate what true repentance really is. And so I hope that's encouraging to you. If you're on the early stages of conviction over sin and confession and you're laying and wallowing in the bed that you've made because you've blown it, continue on. Continue on putting off the old, putting on the new, and prove to yourself and those around you and for eternity, that that really is the Holy Spirit working in you, convicting you of sin, causing you to confess it, and transforming you. Or maybe, maybe you're late in the game. Maybe you've blown it sometime a long time in the past. You've royally messed up, sinfully messed up. But you can tell you're not the same person who did that years ago. The Lord has actually worked and, and you are changed. So take heart because it's only the Holy Spirit that works true repentance. We can tell whether the grief we're experiencing over our sin is just merely the consequences of it like Pharaoh or whether it's the Holy Spirit working in our life by whether there is true repentance in our life that flows out of that grief. Well, what can we learn about God finally? Well, I think we can see that God slowly strips us of idols and dethrones our gods. That's what he's doing with Pharaoh. We think about these plagues. Think about, think about what idols in your life maybe tempt you. To tempt you to I don't trust in something else or take satisfaction in something else other than God. To not acknowledge God as God and do what he's asked you to do. I mean, think about these plagues. The river it was the source of Egypt's greatness. They're in a desert. The only reason that Egypt is the powerful nation that it is is because of this river, the Nile. And the Lord takes that away and turns it into blood. Or think about the frogs and the gnats and the flies. He's taking away the Egyptians' comfort, isn't he? Can you imagine having flies everywhere, gnats in your eyes? It says the frogs were in the ovens and the bowls and dying and stinking. And he hasn't afflicted their health. He hasn't afflicted their lives. He's taken away. What makes them powerful? He's taken away their convenience, their ease in their life. Or when he strikes their livestock, he strikes the animals, they're all dying, rotting in the field. That's a source of food for the Egyptians and not just a source of food. It's how they would have, it was the, the power. It was the machines back then that they would use to till the ground and to grow more food. He's taking away their productivity, taking away 
their sustenance. He strikes them with boils, taking away their health. The hail and the locusts leave just devastation of everything. It's kind of the nuclear option, if you will. The hail comes in and destroys, and the locusts come and eat up everything that it leaves behind. The darkness is a humiliation of Egypt's main deity, Ra, the sun god. Don't miss the irony there. It's not just ironic, it's God's providence. What is he doing when he blacks out the land of Egypt, but wherever his people are, the sun is shining? He's saying it's Yahweh who decides where the sun shines. It's not Ra, it's not your God. He's slowly stripping away the Egyptians of everything that they fall back on and reassure themselves with. And they respond in different ways, right? We saw in chapter 8, verse 19, the magicians in just round three say, we can't produce the gnats. This is the finger of God. They recognize that something bigger is going on here. Later on, we saw in chapter 10, verse 7, Many of Pharaoh's servants are saying, dude, just let the people go. Can't you see? Egypt is burning down around you. We find out later some of the Egyptians even leave with the Israelites, absorbed into God's people. They become believers. But yet Pharaoh and the others choose blindness. They choose blindness. They close their eyes. You know, like a little kid who closes their eyes and puts their fingers in their ear, right? And so the question for us is, how, how do we respond when the Lord strips away the idols, our comfort, our health, the source of our greatness in our own minds, when he leaves us with devastation? How do we respond? Do we acknowledge that it's him? Do we acknowledge that he's God? Do we do what he's asked us, called us to do? Or do we harden our hearts and choose blindness? Last application I think we learn from, about God in this text is just the observation that God is bringing a nation to its knees through his power over their resources. Let that sink in. Before Moses came back to Egypt as God's instrument that God was gonna use to wield creation against Egypt to redeem his people and to judge them, things were looking really good for Egypt, weren't they? Everybody was healthy, happy, the Nile was flowing, they were one of the greatest powers in the ancient world. Pharaoh had everything going for him. The Egyptians had everything going for them and God takes it away and Days, weeks, maybe, maybe a couple of months as this progression of plagues comes. It's a sobering thought. I like to read the newspaper, the actual old physical hard copy of the newspaper because I'm old-fashioned and outdated and I accept it. I, I think about sometimes sitting on the front porch doing that just so I can wait for kids to come on my property and say, get off my lawn, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, just curmudgeon at heart. So I like the newspaper. I, I like to read the newspaper. And it's fascinating to me, I, I, the, the whole scope of geopolitics, right? People talk about it. The experts talk about it as if it's a science. As if there's a finite amount of resources and we got to figure out how to handle what's going on in Eastern Europe and how to handle China and keep North Korea at bay and, and what, what, what the kind of status quo is going to be. They predict it for like 50 years into the future. Oh, 50 years ago, I mean, the Soviet Union was still around, right? I mean, things change. And what, what's fascinating to me is to think about all that, all the experts, all of their projections and thinking they have a handle on how things are, at the end of the day, these nations are just puppets and God is the one who's pulling the strings. It can all change overnight. It changed for Egypt before they even could realize what was going on. They were devastated, destroyed, laid bare by God, the God over creation and their resources. And so there's no arrangement that's permanent. You understand that, right? 
We're kind of lulled into thinking that our experience is how it's always going to be. No arrangement is permanent. Even the present, it's not certain. The apparent future, it's not guaranteed because it's God who is sovereign over nations. The same God that was sovereign bringing Egypt to its knees is the same God that we worship. The same Lord of creation. And I think that's part of the whole connection. When Jesus comes on the scene, generations after this whole exodus happens, of course God's people are still telling this story and reliving it and, and uh, in the Passover and remembering the, the mighty works of God, the Lord of creation, wielding creation for the purpose of their redemption. You look what Jesus does in his ministry. When you think about his miraculous signs that are vetting and proving his teaching, he's reversing the curse. He's giving deaf people hearing. He's giving sight to the blind. He's healing people of leprosy. He's showing that he is the Lord of creation. You know, the feeding of the 5,000. I mean, everybody was just amazed that he just produced all this food and they were really satisfied because they had a belly full of fish and bread. But what was Jesus really doing there? He was showing that just like he spoke the world into existence, he can break bread and create it and, and recreate fish. Remember the story in the boat Perhaps one of the most impressive miracles that Jesus performs during his ministry before the resurrection. All the uh, disciples are terrified for their lives. These seasoned fishermen who knew what they were doing on the Sea of Galilee wasn't their first storm. They're getting ravished by this storm. Jesus is asleep. He finally wake him up and say, hey, w w can you do something about this? How are you sleeping through it? And do you remember what he does? He stands up and he rebukes the waves and the wind and says, peace, be still. And guess what? The waves stop, the wind stops, the storm goes away, and the disciples are awestruck, right? Lifting their jaws up off the bottom of the boat, if you will. And say, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? He is Yahweh. He is the God who delivered his people in Egypt. That's the point of Jesus' miraculous ministry, proving that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not lost on the disciples. It wasn't lost on the early Christians that Jesus was making a claim in his ministry that he is Yahweh, he is God. And the amazing thing is, think about this, when, in the whole theme of God wielding creation for the poor purpose of redemption. How are we even redeemed? How are we saved? We are saved because the God of the universe, God the Son, took on himself a created human nature. In our redemption, in the gospel that we preach, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the salvation that is offered to us because of that. The whole foundation of that is God wielding creation for the purpose of redeeming his people and, of course, judging those who would reject him. Salvation, transformation, the heart change that you and I can experience if we'll put our faith and trust in Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for sins and his resurrection. We'll put our faith and trust in that alone and the Holy Spirit empowers us to turn from our sin and walk towards God to make that 180 that's necessary to prove that our grief is of the Spirit and it's true repentance. All that is founded upon bought for us by Christ, God the Son who took on human flesh and did what we couldn't do in our place, did for us what someone else had to do for us and offers us the hope of salvation, eternal life with him. So let's pray. 
I, I want to just, my, my hope and my prayer as we think about God using creation, it's the same God, he hasn't changed, that wields creation for both redemption and for judgment. It's my prayer that everyone in this room, that all the people that you know in your lives and have influence over and can speak to would, would fall into that category of the redemption bucket, right? Rather than the judgment. Because ultimately, we saw with Pharaoh, it's up to us. God is mysteriously at work and sovereign over salvation, yes, but we can choose today to be saved and to have everything that we experience in this life used for our good and aiming us towards heaven or God's judgment upon us in torment ultimately in hell, very much a reality as well. So let's pray towards that end. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for uh, just demonstrating your power by raising up Pharaoh and bringing him low, by bringing devastation on the Egyptians and redeeming your people. We thank you that you're not demonstrating your power on us in this moment because we don't deserve any better than Pharaoh and the Egyptians, God. But I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives uh, to make sure that we are those who have a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that you might be working in us and through us and all around us in your creation for our good and towards our redemption rather than our judgment. And I pray these things in Christ's name, amen.